again. Nice. And we're live. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the great debate. Not a debate where both sides work to defeat one another, rather a debate where both sides work to find common ground. Today, we have a very special episode and a very interesting and important topic. Today, we discuss the topic of indigeneity, a topic that has stirred up much debate and controversy amongst the people on the land. So in fact, who is indigenous to this land? Is it the Jews? Is it the Palestinians? Both? Neither. Does it even really matter? Today, we take a deep dive on this important topic. Before I introduce our two guests, a few quick reminders. After this live stream, we're gonna go straight to Discord for an after party in the lounge. For those who are new to Discord, it's a very cool platform where you could have these cool voice sessions. So we're going to continue the conversation in Discord. You can ask your guest questions. You can share your thoughts. It's just an all-around fun time. In addition to that, if you like this video, if you like this content, subscribe. If you really like it, we have a Patreon. Support us on Patreon. You help us make more content. And if you like our guests, you can find their contact information in the description, as well as mine. It's great to have you all here with us. So without further ado, our two guests. To my bottom left, Rafi Gassel, a father, Zionist, scientist, and peace activist. He lives in Jerusalem, where he works in biotechnology in the fields of diagnostics and genetic sequencing. Advo he's an advocate for cooperative coexistence and equality in Israel and Palestine through the realization of mutual recognition of indigenous rights for the Jewish and Palestinian people. And to my bottom right, Ryan Belros is a Matisse indigenous person born in High River, Alberta, Canada. He has worked in various capacities in forestry and the oil field. He was a security contractor and a telecommunications analyst and has done community advocacy and activism for over two decades. Ryan was one of the first people to put forward the indigenous indigenous argument in regards to Jews in the Middle East. His many articles have helped change the discord. Rafi, Ryan, it's a pleasure to have you here. We are going to start. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to and I'm you sure you, you could, you could take a guess by the bios who's going to take what stance in this debate. Oh, I'm hearing my audio is going in and out. Is that, uh, can, can we confirm that or are we good? Are we back on? Uh, you're, you're good. I just closed the window. I, okay, I, I'm seeing in the comments, audio is good with me. Awesome, distance. great. We're gonna start with defining indigeneity. I think in order to have productive conversations, we need to agree on definitions. So each guest will have two minutes to explain how they define indigenous or indigeneity. Uh, Ryan, as as one of the main experts on this topic, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I guess the easiest way for me to define indigenous, indigenous communities, peoples, and nations are those that have a historical continuity with pre-invasion and pre-colonial societies that developed on their territory. Uh, they consider themselves distinct from other sectors of those societies that are usually prevailing on those territories. Now, I guess the easiest, like if we're if we're going to boil this down to the very simplest, you have to understand Indigenous people. The, the bottom line for us is that we're our Indigenous status comes from something very simple. It's the genesis of the culture, language, and tradition in conjunction with the connections to its people on an ancestral land. Now, the, I'm just going to hold up my hand here because this is how I this is how I teach the kids when I'm when I'm talking about Indigenous status to kids that have no knowledge about it. Language, land, culture, blood, and spirituality. Now, all of those things work together, just like a hand. They all work together to form what is Indigenous. So in order to be considered Indigenous by other Indigenous people, you have to have those five things working all together, which means you have an ancestral land. You have a specific language that is specific to your people. You have a specific culture. You have blood ties to the people. Those are all the things. The, the spirituality is actually an important piece. It, it, I think of it as one of the primary important pieces. That would be the thumb. But all of those things together are what make a people indigenous. Now, 
the, the problem is that a lot of people don't really understand indigenous st status. They think it just comes from being somewhere a really long time. The reason that most indigenous people don't like that is because, you know, white people have been in America now or in the Americas since 1492. White people in America are not indigenous to America. Now, the last little piece, and, I, and then I'll turn it over to Rafi, the last little piece that's super important is that indigeneity is site-specific. So people call me a native Canadian, but I'm not technically a native Canadian because I'm not, I'm not indigenous to all of Canada. My people are the Métis, and we're indigenous to a very specific place called the Red River in Manitoba. I'm not indigenous to Paddle Prairie, even though Paddle Prairie Métis Settlement is a Métis settlement in Alberta, but it's land that was given to us by the government to prevent us from returning to our ancestral land in the Red River, which is in Manitoba. So that might help people understand a little bit uh, on how indigeneity is, is kind of started. It, it comes from a coalescence of a people and from the genesis of a culture with that people on a specific site of an ancestral land. Thank you, Ryan. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. Oh, you, Rafi. Okay. So, uh, indigenous. Yep. Uh, I'll start with the sort of UN definition, and uh, I'll just mention that I I started reading some of Ryan's blog posts, and I got sort of got sucked in, and I I read like you know hours maybe worth of worth of his stuff, and I I saw his his sort of list also of. Um, of indigenous. So I'll start with the, the UN definition, which I, I read some of Ryan's critique of, and I thought was very interesting. First, the self-identification of indigenous peoples at the individual level accepted by the community as a member. And that, that seems pretty pretty obvious. A historical continuity with pre-colonial or pre-settler societies, strong link to territory and surrounding natural resources, distinct social, economic, or political systems, distinct language, culture, and beliefs, form a non-dominant group in society, which I, I noticed uh, Ryan had a a comment on that, and I, I think it's an important uh, thing to pick apart. And resolve to maintain or, re or reproduce their ancestral environment and systems as distinctive peoples and communities. So, what what I what I noticed that Ryan had uh, in in at least in his writings, he had added uh, occupations in, of ancestral lands, or at least part of them, which I think is a, a an, an important thing. But uh, as as sort of a Zionist, the way I look at an indigenous. The most important thing is self-identification of yourself as indigenous. If you're not claiming to be indigenous, then there's no point in talking about whether or not you're indigenous, because if you don't care, then why should other people? The second thing is is ancestry. I like that. There's a quote from, from Crazy Horse, which is a an, um, Native American activist or Native American you know, chief and uh, warrior in the United States. My lands are where my dead lie buried. You know, the, the most basic thing about being indigenous is you should come from the people who are actually indigenous to the place you're claiming to be indigenous from. If you don't have that, which Ryan mentioned as, as uh, something called blood quantum, if you're not really related to the people, then you're not really indigenous, you're, you're someone who joined the culture that, that, that was indigenous. And the next most important thing I would say is culture. Now, you know, language, religion, customs, something that connects you to having not abandoned the culture that, like, I wouldn't say that I'm indigenous to, you know, uh, the central mountain region in, uh, in, you know, East Africa, even though we had ancestors who lived there, you know, 80,000 years ago, because I have no connection to their culture. I can't claim that I'm a continuation of these, you know, early hunter gatherers who, who migrated to Europe. You know, at some point you, you need to preserve a culture that was, that coalesced somewhere. Um, in Jewish culture, we're a little more forgiving on the issue of culture. If in the event that someone forced you to abandon Judaism, then we're, we're, we're quick to try to invite them back. Like normally if somebody tries to join our tribe, it's sort of a long process. It might take years to have to learn everything about our cultures. They have to commit to, to keeping the, the, our cultural traditions, our religion. But if, if you had somebody like the, the Anusim, the, the forced people of, um, under the Inquisition in, in Spain, so their descendants, we would still consider them indigenous, even though they've, they've adopted Christianity, mainly because they were forced to, to leave. You know, if you put a gun to someone's head and say, stop being stop being your religion or we're going to kill you or we're going to expel you we're, we're a little more sympathetic so we're, we're we're keen to let them to invite them back and if they re-pick up the culture they get to rejoin the group and we're, we're more actively allowing them back into the group if they if they have the ancestry part of this the the issue of dominance which 
Ryan mentioned in, in one of his comments was, you know, in, in the UN, they say you have to be a, a non-dominant group in society. Because generally speaking, when you're talking about indigenous, the point is of calling someone indigenous is to defend their indigenous rights, to protect a minority group that, that was living there like a, uh, you know, by like a, like the Native Americans or the natives in, in South America. And then a more advanced population came and colonized them, a more technologically advanced population. And then they became somewhat subjugated or discriminated against or pushed off their land. So the point of indigenous rights is to protect people that, that need protection. And so once, if you liberate yourself and you take back your homeland, the question is, is are you now still indigenous? Does it matter? You know, because now you're the dominant group in society. And I, I would agree that I don't think if, if the goal is self-determination, if the point of being of the struggle for indigenous persons is to regain control of their home, that you shouldn't lose that status of being native once you gain control. I mean, that, that's the goal. You shouldn't, you shouldn't lose by winning. But at the same time, I mean, the world is very sympathetic to the underdog. And when you become the overdog, you get less sympathy. And a good example I saw with the, the prime minister of Armenia who was being interviewed under by the BBC about what's going on in uh, between them and the Azerbaijanis. And he was trying, and there was a, a peace treaty apparently, or a peace accord pushed forth by the Russians. And he was being interviewed on under why he wasn't going to accept this peace thing. And his basically argument was the Colonel Karabakh is, has indigenous people for Armenians who've been there thousands of years ago, and therefore it's part of my, my country. And the, the, the people at BBC were, were like, you're a warmonger, you know, they were not sympathetic at all. Because once you become, you know, they have, because there's a country called Armenia already. And then once, you know, there's becomes a fine line between indigenous rights when you're a minority and, you know, ethno-nationalism once you become the, man, the majority. Like the, the, I would say the Germans are indigenous to Germany, but nobody bothers mentioning Germans are indigenous to Germany because the, the country's called Germany. You know, when, when they start to assert their indigenous rights, while they're you know ninety percent of the population, you get you get worried about the minorities there, and so if you're under threat, now I wouldn't say this this sort of disqualifies the Jews, and I'll sort of get you know I we're not sort of out of the woods yet. You know the Jews have we were a minority and then came came back to power, but we're still concerned about being minorities again. So if you're under threat and you're a native to some place and you have a native culture you're going to and you're a minority you're going to be called indigenous and if you're the majority you might not get called indigenous and i would think you're still indigenous but it takes on a different a different like uh perspective you know and then in terms of um continuous presence in the land which i noticed uh ryan mentioned in, in one of his in one of his quotes i'm not so sure that that i agree because as a zionist basically i say that like right of return is, is sacred and eternal if someone kicks you off your homeland you have a right to go back forever. It doesn't matter if it's two years or 2000 years, I, I get to go back and it wouldn't, I mean, I know in the Jewish story, there were still Jews here, even like during the crusades, you know, the vast majority of the Jews were getting out of the way. There was a, a you know, a major regional or, or almost world war going on here. And there was maybe a, you know, a small amount of Jews hiding and trying to keep their heads down from, from getting involved in the conflict. My family at the time was, was, you know, on the other side of the conflict in, you know, in France and Germany, trying to, avoid the whole thing and, you know, keep our heads on our shoulders. So even like, I wasn't part of the people who stayed behind. My family was part of the people who were expelled. So I, I feel that, and may not disqualify you, even if somebody came and conquered your homeland, expelled you entirely, and you still held on to the idea that you were going to come back, just like, like Ryan is going to, wants to go back to the Red River. And, you know, I obviously support that. Like, you should be able to go back to your homeland and not lose that just because there wasn't one guy who, who stayed behind. So... Anyways, that in the nutshell is my my thoughts on, on indigenous. The, the main things are, are going to be ancestry and culture and, and some combination of that. See, is the most. Ryan, is there any? Yeah. Do you, uh, really quick about the continuous. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to answer about the continuous presence. That, that's not something that I put in. That That's a, that's direct from Martinez Cobo. Like I said, it, it's the, kind of the most accepted definition. But it's not the only definition. And there are, I do like even myself, my dad, other native activists do have issues with a lot of the language used. And one of the problems I, and I'll agree with you there 100%, there's no such thing as a statute of limitations on being indigenous. That's not how it works. I mean, just because an occupier or a colonizer manages to, like, let's just say, 
remove every single one of you from your ancestral land and move you like the, like what happened with the Cherokee in Oklahoma doesn't mean that a Cherokee person is not still indigenous to Oklahoma, even though they were literally all removed and marched away on the trail of tears. That doesn't remove their indigenous status. So I, I do agree with you hundred percent there, Rob. I, I want to make sure right. that anywhere, any place where we have a disagreement, we should definitely explore that. But I, right. I think that for the most part, listening to your definition, we're going to agree on a lot of things. I think that there's probably just a few key things that we maybe don't agree on. Sure. Worth exploring. So be, before before we get into how these definitions apply to the people living on the land, you know, I, I want to get to something that I think will help us later in the conversation. It's, you know, and, and Rafa, you kind of, you mentioned that part of it has to do with power and who's in control. So, you know, it seems like the term in, indigenous and the concept of indigenous rights was created to, to um, solve a certain problem, right? It, it, the, the word didn't come from nowhere. So is, is it fair to say that in the, the concept of indigenous rights was to, was created in order to protect indigenous people? It, 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 is that, is that part of me, me or Ryan? Well, the, wh whoever wants to, whoever wants to take this. Well, it is, it, it's kind of a difficult thing really to, uh, because to us, indigenous rights, like to indigenous people, to us, it's just basic human rights. I mean, yeah. if you if you actually look at what indigenous people are advocating for, when we advocate for ourselves, we're not advocating for anything. We're advocating for the right to self-determination on our ancestral land. We're advocating for the right to protect our sacred places. We're advocating for the right to perpetuate our language, our customs, and make sure that we actually move forward into the future as a cohesive people. I mean, we're not asking for anything that I think is anything extraneous. So sure. where, where it becomes problematic is, unfortunately, we do have some activists who advocate for other things. I mean, I'm sure you've heard Native people that say, you know, white people all need to leave America, as if that's even a potential of ever happening. I mean, sure. th those people don't speak for the majority. Those are, those are outliers. Right. Yeah, so Rafi. If if sure. I mean... I think indigenous is originally like a, a Spanish word, meaning, you know, the people who came first. I mean, it was how they how the conquistadors referred to the natives that they were were conquering in, at, at the time. But it, you know, by the time it got to the U.N. and they started saying, OK, we should have, a, a you know, an international declaration of uh, protection of the rights of indigenous people. And by the time it got to that, I mean, it, it was to serve the purpose of, you know, people in, in you know, in native populations in Taiwan or in, in China or in Canada, all over the world, there are various indigenous tribes and peoples living in a, you know, a simpler way of life, maybe, or, or a way of life that's been taken over by huge, you know, huge populations that have advanced in, in, in modern technology and, you know, pushing them off their lands and forcing their, their standardization. You know, the Tibetans, you know, China sort of took over all of China and has, you know, wanted to make a standard, standard country. So there you're, you know, you're trying to protect the, these people. And I, the Jews, in my opinion, fit that picture certainly a hundred years ago a hundred percent they were you know fully fully pushed out of our, our homeland and discriminated against everywhere and we're we were one more indigenous people trying to go home and and find self-determination so I, I feel like the way it's used in practice it's it's used like that but i feel like it's also okay to say the germans are indigenous to germany and the finnish are indigenous to finland it, it may not have the same practical application because there are majorities in their country but it's, you know, it, it's a way to, to give respect to some people that are, you know, have, you know, genetic continuity to people who've been there for thousands of years in the same land, which is also, you know, something to, to celebrate in a way. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you both. Ryan, you mentioned something about it, it being just the rights that everyone else has, but how does then indigenous rights differ from just human rights? Like what, why? Where, why is the distinction needed? And I'm, what, what I'm hinting at, and this is this is what I think, but perhaps you have a different perspective, that it, it was a set of rights created due to a certain circumstance. So you you had European colonizers come and, you know, oppress the, the natives in North and South America. You had something similar in Australia. So they created a set of rights that were unique to people who were oppressed from out by outsiders to deal with that specific cir circumstance. Is it fair to say that that's that's 
a very relevant aspect of indigeneity and, and how we look at these rights? I think it's absolutely relevant. I think that if you're looking at it from the perspective of indigenous people, we don't look at these rights as having been created. We look at these rights as, as actually rights that have, were abrogated immediately upon colonization. I mean, part of the problem is like, we, we know this from history. Colonization is not unique to the Americas. Like that's kind of one of the issues that I have with the way this whole discourse is handled. We handle this discourse as if it's okay to colonize in the Middle East because I mean, the Muslims conquered and colonized the entire Middle East and North Africa in the seventh century. And it's almost never mentioned, even though the colonization of the Middle East and North Africa was perhaps one of the most violent colonizations mm -hmm. in, in North and South America or South and Central America. The colonization was was violent at times. But the reality of the situation is most of our people died during diseases that we had no no uh, immunity to. So even though you could look at the sheer numbers and, you know, like the, the most agreed upon numbers are 65 million dead since 1492. So what we call pre pre contact or, or sorry post contact, so sixty five million people over you know what has it been now six hundred and some odd years, those are those are extremely high numbers. Now the problem is that because there was so much you know starvation that's and then death like from starvation and disease, you end up those numbers are different than numbers that maybe were colonized through force. Now. And the biggest problem that I have with this entire discourse is that some people want to excuse certain colonizers because of their skin color, because that this entire discourse now it's been changed. It's it's no longer the indigenous people versus the colonizer. Now it's literally turned into darker skin people against pale skin people. And unfortunately, that that doesn't really work in this paradigm. Like if we're talking about colonization, it really is a colonizer versus the colonized. And unfortunately, and, and this is kind of a, a lot of people are ignorant and they, they just immediately assume the dark skinned people are always good and the white skinned people are always bad. And that comes directly from the work of Edward Said and his whole work about Orientalism, which is basically the, the whole theory of Orientalism is anything white is bad and anything brown is good. Now, that's extremely problematic for, for me as an indigenous person, because what about the Sami? The Sami are an indigenous people of Finland. And not all Finns have connection to the Sami, by the way. A lot of the Finns are actually descended from what they call Fenno Scandinavia, which is, you know, Scandinavians. So it, it, it is a difficult and very nuanced kind of thing to study. And the problem is that a lot of anthropologists who study this stuff, they go in with preconceived notions, and then all they do is confirmation bias. Like, they go in with a, well, I already know these people are indigenous, so I'm just going to study them and and, you know, base my facts and findings on that well the problem is if you start with a with a preconceived notion that's incorrect you end up with bad data I, there's an old computer saying garbage in garbage out so if you put bad data in to start with you're not going to come up with good data and i think that that's kind of where we're at right now when we talk about the middle east is when we talk about the middle east we even like I, I, I kind of I coined a term a couple of years ago because I got tired of hearing people say the term Arab Jews because th those are those are competing ethnicities. They're not there. You can't be an Arab Jew. You could be a Jew from Arabized lands or you could be a Jew who or an Arab who converted to Judaism and became part of the Jewish people. But you would never be an Arab Jew. Those are two very different things. And unfortunately, because the discourse was formed by Europeans. We look at this all through a European lens, all of us, because we're all, we're, whether we know it or not, we've all been colonized. So if you're a Jewish person and you only see yourself through a European lens, how are you ever supposed to understand that you're actually a Jew? You need to be able to be a Jewish person who sees yourself through a Jewish lens. And then you understand, okay, well, my people are from the Middle East. My calendar comes from the, from the Middle East in a very specific place in the Middle East. You know, and, and until you people can start to understand that, this whole problem of, of having an actual rational discourse, how, how do I have a rational discourse with somebody who tells my friends that they're European colonizers from Europe, but his people are not colonizers from the Middle East. His people are supposedly there for thousands and thousands of years, but they still speak Arabic. They still follow Islam. Both, are, both of those are actually indigenous to the Hejaz. The Hejaz is the Arabian Peninsula. 
So I'm not saying that they're, they're not indigenous to somewhere. They can trace their, their roots back usually, and they usually trace it back to the Hejaz. So, I mean, like, like I, I don't mind having these conversations, but the, the important thing is like, you can't build a castle on a foundation of sand. So in order for us to have rational conversations, we both have to be willing to admit the truth. And now part of the problem, too, is that you have some Jews that are going to tell you, oh, well, my family's from Lithuania. It's like, OK, well, where did they come before they went to Lithuania? Like, why, why do you think they spoke Hebrew, even if it was only as a ceremonial language? Right. Those are the kinds of things that if, <clears throat> if we're going to be honest and have an intellectually honest debate and discussion, we have to make sure that we're starting at the same point. And that's with fact. Okay, so, so go ahead. So I don't want to talk for too long. I don't want to. Yeah, I, yeah. That, I mean, like, a lot of what you said about the sort of the left's view of, you know, white people are always bad and and brown people are always are always good, and that sort of clouds the discourse of of indigenous rights, especially in the Middle East, like you know, where, where I live, especially when. when Hundred percent. Yeah. Totally true. Um, so, so that kind of leads us into. Hold on, I'm a uh, star hopper. You're on a you're on a five minute timeout for for another hateful comment. Um, just just learn how to speak normally, bro. It's not it's not that hard. Hopefully, you're in, you're in a better mood when you come back. Anyways, so Ryan, you started speaking on this, but but I, I want I, I want to hear and and Rafi, you can start how your definitions of indigeneity apply to the people of the land, Israelis and Palestinians. Sure. Is it my turn? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to start with, with ancestry. Well, first, I'm gonna, maybe self-identification. I mean, you talk to, talk to Jews who are in the know, the Jews who are especially like in, in Israel, and you ask them where you're from, they say like, they'll tell you that their ancestors came here. I, I knew that growing up in, in Chicago, that my family had come from from uh, Latvia, which is a part of the Lithuanian Empire, and before that we were from from Holland, and before that maybe France. But we knew we came from Israel, and uh, and we were always going back. Like that was that was the mantra we were telling ourselves since I was a kid. And so I we yeah we know we're we're indigenous because we we identify as indigenous. And and when I talk to I talk to a lot of Palestinians, they they feel they they identify that they come from here, and most of them don't have knowledge of of coming from somewhere else, or at least, you know, not in, in all directions of their ancestry. So I, I'm going to touch on, on ancestry because I, I, I work in, in genetics and, and biotechnology. So I've been, I'm sort of a, a science nerd. So I've been following maybe about 20 years worth of genetic studies done on, on Jews and Palestinians. I'm, I'm, you know, really into history and, uh, and the history of this land and the people here. So I was always wondering, you know, trying to prove first that the Jews are actually from here. And then, you know, seeing where, where are the people who are also claiming they're from here. So in May, there, the, this year, there was published in the journal Cell, they took 73 samples of bones that they dug up from all over Israel and a little bit in Jordan and in Lebanon. And they, and they tested them with the autosomal, like a whole genome sequencing. And they found out that the, uh, that the majority of the ancestry of, of modern Jews and modern Palestinians were can be traced to these these people who were living here about let's say three to four thousand years ago you know there was an, an original group of indigenous people we call like the natophians like which means to drip so it's a hebrew word in natofa and they were living here about ten thousand years ago and were literally the first people to use agriculture in the world i mean this is like the the literally the cradle of civilization and then maybe about four thousand years ago you started having people coming in from what what's now kurdistan and um, the, the people called the costume. And this sort of is related to a lot of the, our, our traditions, our mythology about Abraham and his followers followers coming here. And I mean, apparently he was part of a, a, a whole wave of migration from this region to here. And then you see that the people that lived here ended up mixing and you have essentially like, you know, a sort of a merged group of forming here about 4,000 years ago that's, that's sort of coalesced. And that group sort of makes up the majority of, of modern Jews and, and modern Palestinians in our, in our autosomal ancestry. You could say that means like all your genes, not just paternal, not and not just on your mother's side, but just on average altogether, right? And then, and this sort of plays into earlier studies. I mean, I, I I'm finally happy that I was able to see this, you know, really with ancient DNA as opposed to just comparing modern populations like they had done. You know, they were studies where they would look at Jews and Italians and Palestinians and saying, well, Palestinians might be the ancient Israelites and Italians are the ancient Romans, and I'm like, not quite. You know, it's 
they're, they're, they're reasonable stand-ins, you know, in lieu of having actual DNA from people who were here a thousand years ago to, to really, you know, clarify the question. But they're, but it's, it's not quite, but you could even see, like, I'm, I'm a religious scientist. I come from, you know, sort of a right-wing background. I was on the central committee of the Bayou D party, and I, I have lots of friends and family who live in, in the settlements. So that's like, I'm, I'm on the right wing of, of culture, culturally here. So I, I'd go around like the Shabbat table and, and have conversations about, about Arabs and background and, and stuff for a long time. And a lot of people would tell me the story that the Palestinians came here maybe a hundred years ago from every other Arab country than here. And I was like, okay, maybe that's true. So I, I would look at, you know, studies, especially from like uh, Daron Bahar and Harry Oster and the, the stuff coming out even, even 10 years ago and, and even 20 years ago. And I was like, that, that just doesn't, that's not tenable with the data. And you see, like, when you look at the, the way Palestinian ancestry works, you see they all tend to cluster with each other. You know, somewhere in between maybe Lebanese and Saudi Arabians, about where they fit on the map. And if there was really, like, half of them were, were Egyptian, half of them were Saudis, and half of them were Lebanese, they would look, they would be scattered all around the, the map, and you don't see that. You see that, like, and there was there was other studies where they, they they're sort of a mix between the, the native people who lived here, maybe 60% of their ancestry, it's hard to get exact numbers. And then the rest of their ancestry is, is coming from, like you said, from the, from the Arabian Peninsula. And, and this, but this mixing happened at least a thousand years ago. It wasn't the, the mythology that they came here, you know, a hundred years ago. And I, I think a, you really want to start from a foundation, not a foundation of sand. If you want to understand why this conflict is serious and you, you, you think you think if I just hang tough, but my, the people are who are my my supposed enemies, they're really lying. They're not really from here, and the Palestinians totally think this about the Jews as well. They're not really from here, and if we we're st they call themselves the steadfast people. If we if we hang tough, they're going to melt away because because they're not really from here. We're we're the real natives, and in the end, it'll work out for us. We've been here for for a thousand years. We know it's in our in our heart, and they've got nothing. And when you're thinking about that and, and the other side is thinking the same thing and they really have like blood ancestry going here for thousands of years, you're both, you're, you're deluding yourselves. I mean, regardless of whether or not, you know, they fit in the neat box of, of indigenous, they've been, both sides have roots here going back, back, you know, thousands of years. And that's not something to be, be trifled so, with. Robbie, yeah. yeah. There's two, there's two, two things there. there, there there's two, you're, you're making two separate arguments, but I want to deal with both first. OK, sure. first off, ind uh, indigeneity, DNA itself doesn't really mean anything to us. And I'm going to explain why. Remember sure. at the very start when I said that being indigenous is site specific. OK, so when, when you talk indigeneity as being site specific, that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be intermingling of DNA. It doesn't mean, sure. especially when you have people that have lived side by side for centuries. Now, you have to you also have to understand that even according to the Arabs own uh, history. When they conquered Medina, Medina was a Jewish city. Medina was filled with Jews. And even according to the like Islam's own definitions, what they did was they took over that city, killed all the men, and forced the women to marry. Now, where, where does DNA come from? Right? Sure. So if you marry a whole bunch of women that are Jews, and you marry them into your people, and you force, force them to have children, your first generation is obviously going to carry Jewish DNA. Now, it's no different than in North America. The Blackfoot and Cree, which are the two native tribes in Alberta where I am, they yeah. fought constantly. But if you do a DNA test, you find very quickly that there are a lot of Cree people that carry Blackfoot DNA and vice versa. That doesn't mean that a Cree person is suddenly Blackfoot because they carry some Blackfoot DNA. And it doesn't mean that a Blackfoot would be Cree just because they carry some Cree DNA. Now, where this whole discourse kind of gets off the rails is when people say, well, you know, all of the Palestinians carry Jewish DNA. Well, they've lived in Israel now for uh, over a thousand years. Of course, there's going to be intermingling. Of course, there's going to be. And there were actually people, and I, I know some of them, who live in the PA, who admit that they are probably converted Jews. They still, right, some of them right. even light candles. They couldn't tell you why they light the candles. They did a tradition. Now, that doesn't make them Jewish. Now, it, what it does if they suddenly decide one day, hey, you know what? I want to explore that part of my my uh, my person. I want to explore that piece of my identity. I want to understand more about Jews. More power to them. But it doesn't make someone Jewish just because they carry some Jewish DNA. 
And it's super important to understand that because once you adopt the conqueror's man mantle, like once you put on that cloak and say, I am a member of the, the dominant society that has colonized you, it doesn't matter if you carry indigenous DNA. That then, then it ceases to actually matter to indigenous people because you have now decided it would be like me. Look at me. I have pretty pale skin. My mother is Norwegian. They're the whitest people on the planet. Okay. My dad's Métis. But if I was to shave my beard, cut my hair, you know, leave my glasses on so I look a little bit more like a white guy and tell everybody, my name's Ryan Bellarose. Bellarose is a, actually technically a French patronomic name. I'm actually just French and Norwegian. Then other Métis people would actually stop seeing me as Métis. They would say, okay, well, you know what? If you're going to tell everybody you're French and Norwegian and benefit from the fact that you have pale skin, we don't see you as part of the Métis community anymore. So when we're talking about Indigenous status, we have to be super careful with this stuff. Look, I'm not saying that there aren't Palestinians who carry Jewish DNA. I'm not saying that there aren't Palestinians who do have ancestral ties. They do have an ancestral connection. They've lived there for a thousand years. Of course, they're going to have an ancestral connection. What they don't have is a distinct culture. What they don't have are any signifiers or any cultural constructs that are purely Palestinian. If you take a look and you ask them specifically, give me three cultural constructs that are strictly Palestinian. They are not Arabic in any sort of way. You never get a straight answer. The only answer I ever got and it's kind of a funny answer, but it's kind of ridiculous. I, I asked for three cultural constructs, and a pro-Palestinian told me, oh, well, sperm smuggling. Palestinian sperm smuggling is a cultural I, construct. Blog, because yeah. apparently, yeah, exactly. Apparently, when a, when a, when a man gets put in jail for throwing rocks at Israelis. Ryan, yeah? I, I just want to propose a, a slightly different way of, yeah. of looking at the, at the DNA thing. I, I personally don't think it's... It's really important either. I think it might be the least important aspect of this argument, but I'm not sure it's right to look at it as Arabs came here and then in intermingled yeah. with some Jews. I think uh, a better way to look at it is that when most Jews were exiled, some remained on the land. When, when Arabs colonized this yep. land, eventually the Jews living here were Arabized and then intermixed, but it's not... It, it's not yeah. that, yeah. right? So it's it's populations that have been living here continuously for thousands of years. So, so that, that that's just okay. On, on but point. now you and, and, and I understand. And, and me, me as an Ashkenazi Jew, right? Yeah. Ashkenazi Jew, they discover is only fifty percent of of Ashkenazi DNA comes from this region, and the the other fifty percent is is somewhere in in Europe. That's what that's what DNA tests. Something like that, right? Forty five percent. Well, something the majority, like that, yeah. but from the, from the Again, Middle East. But, uh, that's, why having, that's why we're having discussions about indigeneity. We talk about blood quantum, right? Because blood quantum is actually something that white people came up with in order to determine who an Indian actually was. The problem with blood quantum, and I've said this many times in my writing as well, the problem with blood quantum is that one of the ways that you get rid of indigenous people is to breed them out. And the French version, the the the, the Frank, the French, the way that they colonized other places was actually to breed out the natives. Like if you look at French Algeria, that was a that, yeah. that was an actual French way to colonize, was to basically show up somewhere and breed the natives out. Now, that that's why I would what what I'm saying that in the DNA it, as it's, as it's by itself it's, does oh, not yeah. designate someone who's indigenous. I, I I agree. I don't I don't think DNA makes you only indigenous, but it, you, you mentioned that, that some of the Palestinians have, have Jewish ancestry. I, I would say that that's the overwhelming prevailing situation here. And I wanted to, I wanted to get into the into the cultural aspects, but just to sort of sum up the, the DNA, it's the, the majority, there were basically Hebrew people, the, the, the Canaanites who also spoke Hebrew, and the Edomites, the Israelites, all these people, the, the Hebrews. And then not really too far from here, you had the Arabs. Even now in, in parts of southern Israel, even, even thousands of years ago, there were people who spoke Arabic. They were, these are our bordering, bordering native tribes. And, but the, the majority of the ancestry of the modern, modern Palestinian is Hebrew. And in, in sort of in our culture, we think that if someone was pressured or, under, or forced to give up their, their identity, that we're, we're sort of lenient to letting them, them come back. And I, I, I'm sort of sympathetic to the fact that they, they know that they're, 
that their people were here and they for for thousands of years and it's not that they were like the you know the arabs came here and just like raped everybody i mean what they what what happened in a lot of cases where they sort of pressured people into into converting to other religions and over time sort of mixed with the with the other people and they maintained a lot of a lot of culture a lot of jewish traditions i mean I know people who tell me that they they keep challah where they take a piece of the bread and they stick it to the side of the oven as sort of like a, a sacrament of of the of the bread when they make bread for Shabbat. They're like Shabbat candles, like you you say. They also break a glass, and they don't know why they're breaking the glass. I mean, I, I tell them that they're they're breaking it because to remember the destruction of Jerusalem, but they're maintaining these these very Jewish customs. And I also, in terms of other customs that are uniquely Palestinian, just in general, they have you know distinct uh, distinct foods. There's like kanafe, there's, uh, you know, cheese from Akko. There's certain, there's certain uh, you know, delicacies that are unique to Palestinians. The, the Dubkate dance, which is not, at least not from Arabia, it's unique to the, to the Levant. You can't, you can't use regional cuisine as a cultural construct if that regional cuisine is across the board. That's kind no, of my no, point. No, I noticed in the comments no. some people were like, you know, if you're, if you're going to talk about actual cultural constructs, they have to be actual cultural constructs that are specific to the Palestinians. So when they say we have a special way that we, we make a thobe, well, guess what? Thobes are across the Middle East. We have a special way that we dance the dabka. Yeah. Guess what? The dabka is an Arabic dance, and every single group of Arabs has a dabka. So those are not – it's like dialect. Uh, it's if you're old speaking old Arabic – like that's not hold on I, I just want to chime in real quick i, I think n th there's an issue here that none of us are actually experts on palestinian culture none of us are palestinians we, we didn't grow up in a palestinian family so we're all coming a little bit from a place of ignorance that doesn't mean that doesn't mean you could you can't not be an expert on palestinian culture if you're not palestinian i just don't think we're, we're experts that being said they do have distinct dishes knafe what came from Palestinians. They have this giant falafel ball that they eat, which is, you know, made by yeah, Palestinians. But, 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 yeah. hold, on, hold on real quick. I'll, I'll, I'll give you both the floor. I just want to put, put a concept out there. The, the thing with culture is that it's so fluid. It, it changes every single day that Jewish culture today is so vastly different from Jewish culture 2000 years ago that it's, I would say, unrecognizable. Sure, there may be some traditions that that are the same, but Jewish culture today is more similar to Palestinian culture today than our culture is to what it was 2000 years ago. So aren't we getting stuck on something that, that changes every day? So how much importance does something like that carry? It, it's, it's of primary importance. Cause think about this, lots of out, out the outer manifestations of Jewish culture have changed a little bit. The core culture of Jews has never changed. And if you take a look at the core culture, your core culture, Adar, I guarantee is the same as Rafi's core culture. It's the same as a Jew that's living in Poland. It's the same as a Jew that's, that was living in Morocco. Your core culture has remained the same. What, that's what, what that's the that key culture? here. Because, I mean, if you look. Can, can we talk about it's, what it's that core Jewish is? culture? I, I, like, look at the thing. That, okay. I'm, I'm just saying. So when you, when Jew, you look I, at the, the core of a culture, right? Yeah, we're we're having yeah. a little laugh. You, you as a Jew, you you probably are. Oh, sorry. You 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 notice? Um, I'm trying to think of an easy explanation that uses Jews. Okay, uh, kitniot, right? The you you know about the whole fight about kitniot. Some some Jews think mm -hmm. you can eat beans. Some Jews think you can't eat beans, right? On Passover. But at the yeah. end of the day, what 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 is the whole discussion about, right? That whole discussion is still about one very specific thing. It's during a specific time of the year when you're not allowed to eat certain things. Now, the fact that some Jews from some areas are allowed to eat those things and some Jews aren't is less important than the fact that both of you still maintain that core holiday. So you both you both understand that that's a specific time of the year when you're not supposed to eat something. Now, whether or not you agree on what that something is, is immaterial. The fact is you both agree that that is a specific way to interact during that time. Now, the reason that, that this, and so I noticed in the comments, they're talking about how cultures evolve and cultures change. The core culture doesn't really evolve. The core culture doesn't really change. The core culture is still the same thing. Now, it, it's no different than Native Americans, and I'll, I'll use a Native American analogy because it's easier for people that don't know much about Jews. 
when you have two cultures living side by side, of course, they're going to change a little bit. They're going to adjust to each other. But the thing is, they both still have their own language. They both still have their own way of, of interacting with the creator. They both still have their own cultural manifestations. So if you look at like a Cree person's moccasins, that's an easy way to understand it. If you're if you're a native person here and I hold up a Cree moccasin and a Blackfoot moccasin, you would know right away which one was which because they're very different. Even though we both wear moose hide shoes, basically, is what they are, they, they're one would look different than the other because it's a different tribe. Now, the, the reason that they we're, we're even having this argument, and I know where it's going, is because people are upset now because I said that the Palestinians don't have any cultural constructs. Now, when we ask for a cultural construct, I want something that is specifically Palestinian the way that something can specifically be Jewish. Like in, in, in the Middle East, we all know there's lots of cultures that have that, what do they call the little hand thing, the hamsa? The Hamsa, yeah. Hamsa, I think. Sure, yeah. We, we, There's we, lots we, of we, different cultures that have that. But how many cultures have a menorah as a symbol? Right? That's a very specific Jewish thing. And when you see a menorah, you know immediately that something is Jewish. Okay? When, when we're talking about language, when someone speaks Hebrew, Hebrew is not Arabic. Right? It's very different. So when, you, when someone speaks Hebrew, we know immediately that person's Jewish. So you, you, there's things that you know that are very distinct that would be very Jewish and not anything else. So all I'm asking is that if, you, if you're going to say that the Palestinians have all of these cultural constructs, show us something that is specifically Palestinian that is not just a small change from something else that all the other Arabs do or have. Now, I'm not talking about, well, they put pine nuts and onions in their chicken. That, that's not enough for me to say, well, that's a cultural construct. So I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm let, fully willing. I, look, I, I'm I'm still not fully. I, I still don't fully understand what Jewish culture is, and I'm saying this as a Jew. I understand aspects of of our tradition that are connected to the religion, but what, you know, at any time I've traveled the world, I I don't. People can't tell I'm Jewish because of how I act, because of my customs. They actually think I'm just a Westerner. If anything, my my culture is more Western Eurocentric. Not by any choice of my own, but but I you know yeah. I I just it's not clear what to me exactly what Jewish culture is and well that's and when it comes to language, the Jews it's true, it's true that it's true that we have a distinct language it doesn't resemble ancient Hebrew right and and that being said oh, Palestinians yeah. well like we we wouldn't be it's we wouldn't be able to understand ancient yeah. Hebrew and they they don't understand be able, probably wouldn't be able to converse. understand us. But no, no, hang but, on, hang on. That's that. Wait, wait, one last thing. Wait, one last thing. That you're okay. Yeah, you, you, I'll give you the floor, and, and then and then Rafi. Sorry, Rafi. I've, um, sure. Palestinians speak Palestinian Arabic. It's distinct. They have their own slang. They have their own accent. So it's not entirely true that it's just Arabic, right? That you know, every every part of. And again, you might think it's not distinct enough. It's a dialect. I speak at Palestinian Arabic. And, um, a little bit at least. And it, it, I, I can't understand Iraqi Arabic. I can't understand, you know, Hijazi Arabic or, or Arabic from Saudi Arabia or, or from Egypt. But if you can understand basically in Palestine, Jordan, which is basically the same. And then it'd be Lebanese and Syrian is similar enough. People say I sound Lebanese when I try to talk Arabic because of the accent. But uh, but it, it, there's a Levantine Arabic dialect, which, you know, has influences from Aramaic and other di and other and other languages that pre-existed here. But um, yeah, it's a dialect. It's a dialect. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, now, I don't the the that reason that from the comments, Rafi, okay. And like, and I, I know, I know that you understand this because you and I actually had this argument once a long time ago on Facebook. Sure. The key, the key, is, and I think this is where people go off the rails is I'm talking about indigenous status from a, from a position of indigeneity from where I literally go over the hand. So language, land, culture, blood, spirituality. How do those things interact? Why are they important? That's the bottom line for me. What I'm noticing from, from people that don't have all of those things working together in conjunction is that they say, well, why are you even talking about culture? What does culture have to do with indigeneity? Like, if, if you're going to be a, an, a call yourself an indigenous person and, and base your indigenous status on your DNA, then you damn sure better be manifesting that by saying, okay, well, if, if I have Jewish DNA, what are the things I'm doing 
to, to show that? How am I manifesting that? Because it's okay to like, look, we're, we're even acting right now. Like I'm, I'm saying the only people that have rights are the indigenous people. That's not what I'm saying at all. Mm-hmm. And that's never been what I say, but I'm just from reading these, these comments. Like I, I, I know we it. said we were going to try not to get distracted, but I mean, like these are people that are saying that, oh, well, Jews are all white colonizers from Europe. And then they have the gall to say, well, why is this an even an important conversation? We're having this conversation because there are people that say Jews are white European colonizers. We're having the conversation because, Adar, you, you live in Israel, right? But sometimes when I'm talking to you, I feel like I'm talking to like a European person just because the lens that you're viewing this through is a very European kind of lens. Instead of, and I, I don't mean this as an insult, like this, is, I still see myself through a European lens. Why? Because... of what I deal with in my life is through that European lens. All the media that I ever get to watch is through a European lens. When When I dream, sometimes I dream in Cree, and when I wake up, I actually have to think about the dream before I can interpret it because I'm 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 speaking Cree in my own dream, but it's a language that I only speak once in a while at home. So even though that's my actual first language, a lot of times I have to sit and think about things because I don't get to watch Cree television. I don't get to watch sports in Cree. I don't get to read books in Cree. So, like, when we're having this conversation, I I can't help but get sidetracked by seeing these people that say stuff like, well, you know, I don't think that Indigenous status is important and it doesn't matter. They both still live there. Absolutely. Look, at the end of the day, we know that the Palestinians aren't going anywhere. But at the end of the day, they need to understand that you're not going anywhere because that's your ancestral land. Now they can they can say whatever they like. Bottom line, show us. So you want to you you want to say that you're indigenous? Okay, give me some cultural constructs. And I saw somebody say define a cultural construct. It's very simple. Something that is purely Palestinian, right? Something that's purely Palestinian that has no connection at all to Arabs. We already said there's a bunch of different things that that are Jewish that have no connection to anybody else. Like they're they're very Jewish things. Sure, but so, I would say Palestinians hold on to a bunch of things that are that are also Jewish things. In a way, they're they're like the lost, you know, sheep of of the people who are living here. They're holding on to, you know, the the traditional Palestinian dress is found in pictures in in Egypt for how the Canaanites and how the Israelites used to dress. They're they're holding on to some traditions that we used to have, and they're they're maintaining some Jewish traditions. And, the, and they're holding on, you know, the majority of their ancestry is the same as our ancestry. So it's it's difficult for me, you know, especially people who have been, you know, sent in a diaspora, sent all over the world and, and discriminated against to, you know, fault them for having stayed here and given in to, to pressure to assimilate, you know, even though and, and at the same time, try to at least maintain, you know, a sliver of their of uniqueness of the culture that they had before. And. So and 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 the fact that they've been here, they have roots here for not like a few hundred years, for for thousands of years. It's difficult for me to come here and say, and especially that I've I've returned, you know, ten years ago, and the Jews had come here, you know, 150 years ago. There were, I mean, there were still Jews here, obviously, but you know, in mass, we returned, especially the Jews from Europe. And for us to say, well, we're we're more indigenous than you, who have been pretty much living here consistently since we left. And yes, things. But you see, know, your culture has changed. But you're, I, 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 am not, I don't disagree with you on some of that. Where I disagree with you is when you say all of them have been here that long. The, the numbers are obvious. If you look at the Ottoman census, a lot of these people did come at the turn of the century, Rafi. Like I, I that's, don't the, think, that, that's not. I mean, that's well, what I, don't, would, it doesn't, I started with, with the DNA. It, that it, that, that yeah, theory is not tenable. The maybe, idea that. Yeah, it, but the, there's just not it's much about number. That. There's not much to do with the even even if some Palestinians came at the turn of the century, which we we know to be the case. That, you know, Palestinians they're all living together. So there's, you know, what are you going to do? I know. Indigenous status. Again, you know, there's there's not much to do with that. Dar, it goes right back to what I said at the very start, right? It all goes right back to that. There there's a foundation here that we have to set. One of the things that we know. How many people lived here at the turn of the century? It's not a thing that we, that, you know, it's not my opinion. It's what the actual Ottoman Turk census says lived here. We know how many Arabs came here when the British started building infrastructure. 
we know from the Peel Commission what the actual populations were. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, with all the intermarriage, because obviously, if, even if they've only been here, if, if say, 100,000 came, those people had to marry somebody. Obviously, they're going to marry somebody from the place. I'm not saying that none of these people have a connection. I'm saying that there was a massive influx. We have to take that kind of stuff into account. I would, I, we also would, have to. I don't see the evidence for the massive influx. I mean, I know that the British took a census the when they came here in, in 27, and when they left, and during the time that the British were here, about 30,000 people showed up out of a population of 1.2 million non-Jews. So that's a, roughly, you know, a little less, maybe 3% of the population is coming from these, these, these immigrants. Ottoman information is, is limited to how much, you, how much is actually known about, about how many people were actually here. And they, didn't have, they don't have an immigration registry. There's no, there's no data on how many people came in. So it's, it's very speculative. And the numbers uh, it, of how much they grew are within, are within, reasonable, with, within a reasonable amount of growth rate. If you started with, you know, 600,000 in, in the mid, you know, in the mid 1800s and you get by, by 1917, you get to about, you know, you get or you started with 300,000 and then you get to, to 600,000 by 1917. And then you by 1948, you're double that at 1.2 million. Those are not impossible numbers when you take a, a you know, pre-industrial society and start giving them modern medicine and draining the swamps and, and giving them modern infrastructure. You know, doubling your population in, in 50 years and then in another in another 30 years doing it again. It's, it's not unreasonable. And when I saw, I'm, I'm saying I took that theory as a possibility, but I'm, I'm saying I looked at, at the genetic data at least, and it's just you can't you can't really prove that unless you're saying unless they all came from Jordan, because Jordanians and Palestinians are identical, because it's it's the same country. You know, it, this was all called Palestine, and people would live move back and forth across the river. This was not, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 the Jordan Valley being the border is sort of an artificial designation yeah. that we've created in modern times. All of these borders, Rafi, that, that, that's kind of yeah. been my point from the beginning. Like, everyone's making this sound like, oh, well, the fact that they carry this DNA shows that they've been here. The, the truth is, all of these borders are just lines drawn on a map by white people. Like, the original borders of, of the Middle East look nothing like they look now. Like, when indigenous people make borders, we make borders based on valleys. We make borders based on rivers. That's how we define our ancestral territories. So sure. this whole idea that Jordanians would be different, of course they're not different. Like, and Iraqis, of course they're not different. All of all of these no, people Iraqis across the Middle East. Iraqis are different than Jordanians and, and Lebanese and Syrians. Yeah, there's, you can tell there's they, they have different now because they came mainly from Syrians. But that, what I'm saying is that all of the people of the Middle East, we, we could call them native Middle Easterners, if that makes it a little more clear for people, just like we call them native Canadians. I mean, there's, a thousand different tribes in Canada, but we say native Canadians as a group. Right. But what I'm saying is again, with site specificity, specificity, we want to make sure that we understand where Jews are from. We want to make sure we understand where Arabs are from. Arabs are from Arabia. All right. Arabized people are all over the Middle East, but they don't self-identify yeah. as Arabized people. They self-identify as Arabs. Once well, they start self-identifying. Self no, wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait Rafi, I, I want to, sorry, sorry to cut you off, Rafi. Once they identify as Arabs, then what? Once they identify as Arabs, they are Arabs. That's you, you guys are the ones that are bringing up the self-identification and you're bringing up the fact that each group of people has a right to self-identification. Okay, okay but, well, but, these are Arabs that are self-identifying yeah, as Arabs. They don't claim, get to, they don't claim they're from Arabia. Arabia. There's no Palestinian it does. you. He has the right to immigrate to Saudi Arabia, and there's no Saudi Arabian who would tell you I have the right to immigrate to Palestine because I'm Arab. They don't see it as like every one of them is one is one country. And once you start calling yourself part of the Arab people, which doesn't necessarily really exist, this is sort of that that's really a construct. You know, they they don't really speak a, a common language. They have a common language that they've you know created maybe within the last hundred years that they can all able to speak. But they, like the Germans did, and like many other people, they have a standardized Arabic. But they they weren't able to all really communicate with each other. You know, they had they were able to read the Quran, but yeah. But you have to, you have to understand you, something very simple. It all goes back. Yeah. You guys are like and I know the left is very big on self identification, right? If an Arab person tells me I'm an Arab, 
I'm not going to go and dig through their DNA to say, well, actually, you're you're Lebanese, so therefore you're more closely identified as a Canaanite. Like, I'm not going to tell them that if they if they speak Arabic, they follow the Arabic. They're, they're Arab. Yeah, but no, but they don't but, get. But, Ryan, I'm, yeah, but, yeah, but, but Ryan, if somebody identifies as Arab, let's let's say that's completely their choice. Even though Arabs are not a monolith, not even close to a monolith. Why should why should they lose what constitutes as indigeneity and indigenous rights just because of a self identification? Because, like I said earlier, once you adopt the conqueror's mantle, we're not dealing with two groups of people that are equal. We're dealing with groups of people who conquered and colonized the entire Middle East, and a group of people that is an incredibly small group of people from a very specific place. So, you as a Jewish person, you should be extremely concerned. That all of a sudden there's a group of Arabs that are telling people, oh, well, actually, because we're de descended from Jews, we're actually Jewish. Okay, well, but you've identified as long as it's been good to be an Arab, then they were Arabs. Now, all of a sudden, we're talking about indigenous stuff. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, but by the way, we do carry some Jewish DNA. So we're Jews, too. It's like, no, you don't get to be the conqueror colonizer and indigenous. Jews, But they, they claim to be Canaanites. But it doesn't matter because, yeah. but and I can show That's you DNA crazy. from a Canaanite and wow. a non Palestinian and say, why, why, why? and I can show you my DNA is the is majority the same thing as Canaanite. The, the, the Hebrews, yeah. I mean, the Hebrew was the language of the Canaanite. Yeah. And the Israelites were a tribe of Canaanites that, that, you know, became the dominant group culturally. And yeah, absolutely. But Rafi, Rafi, there's one really important piece here that you're missing, right? Mm -hmm. Jews have been saying that there, there's Canaanites in your bloodlines for years and years and years. The Arabs only started saying it when we debunked the whole, I'm a plishtim. But, but, it's like, you know, but, coming from, what, from the sea kind of makes it so that we don't think of you as indigenous. When no, you name I, yourself after, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't think you can knock them for the name. I mean, your ancestors didn't necessarily always call themselves the Meti. Meti is, is a French word meaning, you know, mixed people. Mate. So, Right, yeah. I mean, they were they were Cree, they were Ojibwe, they were they were whatever they were before this, and that that part is what makes you you know. So the pal so the fact that they use the name Palestinian, which I think is a legitimate term, the the original Philistines were a small group of, of people who migrated here from from Crete, along with people from Mycenaean Greece and Sardinia, and they were a tiny minority who who colonized the coast the coastal lands. The northern group of them were, were, were conquered by the Israelites and absorbed into the Israelites. The southern group of them sort of merged with the Canaanites, but they kept the name. They brought, you know, their, their pottery, some of their, some of their religious culture and their ironworking. And so the, and they became the Philistines, even though 200 years later, you, you've done DNA tests and we see the average Philistine was 99%, you know, Canaanite. You couldn't tell who was Philistine, you know, their, their DNA had totally been washed in. They were a small minority, but they kept the name Philistine for, for the hundred, the, the 600 years that the kingdom of, of the Philistines existed. And then when the kingdom of the Philistines was, was, was felled by the, by the Babylonians, this name even main, was maintained by the Greeks who kept calling it Philistine because they were ethnically Greek people who founded this. So that's how they viewed it. And it was later that the Romans who were, who knew that the Jews call themselves Judeans, we hated the Philistines. So they called it like, you know, Dafka, as we say, just to piss us off. They started calling the place Palestine. And then for 1,800 years, it was called Palestine. And Jew, Christian, Muslim, that was the way to refer to people who lived here. And so it's the fact that Jews are not Palestinians, and they are, that's a modern invention. But people would call themselves Palestinians. That was just a colloquial term for, for the region. And they've sort of, yeah, that, that has right. hardened over the last 60 years, obviously, due to this conflict. But now they're very Palestinian. We're very Israeli, you know, in a, in a way that we weren't. But that doesn't re reduce them from being from being from here just because, you know, I don't identify. I deal with the. I identify with the name Philistine. Is in Hebrew we call it. We say it means invaders. When you know it actually means the people from the sea in, in, in ancient Greek. But we. But in our language, we hated them so much. That's our word for invaders. You know. It, but it doesn't mean that they, if they're calling themselves that, it makes them an invader. When you know their ancestry is, is primarily well, benefit from it. Off. If we're going to like, OK, so now we're, we're going back quite a ways in history and I'm totally OK with that, because now what you're doing is you're saying, OK, well, they call themselves invaders from the sea. That doesn't make them invaders. But when they benefit from the colonization of the Middle East now, whether you agree with this or not, for a long period of time, Arabs were ascendant in, in Israel. 
They were ascendant. They were on top. But then other Muslim cultures, other caliphates took over. Now, one of those caliphates was run by the Kurd. One of those caliphates was run by the Persians. But they were still caliphates. So they were still Muslim. So they benefited, just maybe not as much as they did when it was Arab Muslims who were in charge. Now, sure. you don't get to say, I'm an Arab Muslim as long as it's what's best. But now suddenly, you know, the world is starting to recognize indigenous rights. and The world is starting to pay attention. They, they realize that there was a dig in Israel that proves that there was a certain year when the Canaanites stopped eating pork. They go through the garbage, they find bones, they realize, yeah. wait a minute, there's an actual year that we can determine now when the Jews became, when the Canaanites became Jews and stopped eating pork. Now, if you can do that kind of stuff and you can actually trace your roots back to that culture, that's one thing. Well, when you just start saying, okay, well, you know what? We, we tried the Palestinian thing. We, we tried the, the Plishtim. We tried saying, okay, we were descended from the Palestinians. That was debunked hard. We do have DNA that can show that we're part Canaanites. So now we're going to claim that we're Canaanites. It's like, no, you don't get to do that. You don't get to keep changing the goalposts because your right. argument got debunked. I, I don't, I, it, for me, it's, wait, not wait, about, Rafi. it's not about winning. Rafi, Rafi real quick. Well, that's exactly what it's you, about. You, uh, Ryan, you, you may have endless critique of the Palestinians, and which is fair. Well, I, that, that's not the conversation for now. I just don't see how any critique you have makes them lose indigenous status if the, if if we're going to agree that indigenous status is a thing we we already defined a criteria that it's connected to language land culture blood and spirituality and while we can argue yeah. how each population is connected the mistakes or the the personal identity of the palestinians doesn't in any way counter our definition our agreed definition of indigeneity so i'm, I'm not sure that it, it's it's quite so let's, relevant let's go, for now. Let's go later. okay so let's go through them okay so language, what language do I would say 99% of the Palestinians speak? What language? Palestinian speak, uh, dialect of Arabic. And they all, a lot of them okay, so speak Hebrew as well. If we're being, yeah, if we're being extremely generous, we'll say Palestinian dialect of Arabic. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Land. Now we, we know that they already, they're claiming that they have connections to the land. One thing that I'm going to ask, okay, how many of their actual myths how many of their legends how many of their personal stories have to do with that specific piece of land because I, I hear them all the time talking about right. we have a connection to the land okay well tell me some stories that you tell as palestinians that have something to do with the land and no i'm not just talking about the bible i'm talking about actual stories to do with the land okay but we don't have a well, palestinian here obviously i can't debunk that they don't have a, that doesn't mean they don't have a deep connection to the land right you, you, you don't need a story in order to have a connection to the land it are everybody can say they have a deep connection to the land my family's lived in paddle prairie now since probably the late 1800s i do not have an ancestral connection to paddle prairie paddle prairie is not my ancestral land the red river is my ancestral land all right. Just because a word has words have meanings, we have to make sure we stay with the meaning. So now we've done. We did language. We did land. Let's do culture. Palestinian culture. Give me some manifestations of Palestinian culture. Tell me what Palestinians do that is so different from any other Arab that we could say that's specifically Palestinian. Okay. And then we do blood. Obviously, we we no, know that some carry and most Ryan, don't even like to admit it. Just to answer that, yeah. I I think there are certain aspects of culture that that are Palestinian. Are they similar to a aspects of other Arab cultures? Sure, but I, I'm pretty sure that most distinct aspects of Jewish culture are also similar to other cultures around the world. It's not it's not like Judaism is this super distinct and unique culture that's easy to identify. I, I don't even think we mentioned so many things. I mean, the menorah as a symbol, sure. And the, a debate about Kitniot, but that's not like, it's not like it's so clear that our culture is so well defined and Palestinian culture is just, you know, is shallow. I, I, no. I, I just don't, I just don't see that. You guys even have, you even have a calendar that's based on your specific area. Okay. Like you have a lunar calendar that doesn't make sense. They use that calendar too. You Arabs use that calendar. They, they, they also use a lunar calendar. Their calendar was switched a few times. We actually had a, a completely different calendar during the um, during the periods of the temples, and then this, the current calendar was actually in, in instituted by the rabbis. It was similar in, in some ways to the Greek calendar, which which was a, a lunar calendar, which was with a with a forced on us, 
and and but it's not it's not identical to our current calendar. And the rabbis they didn't like the the priests who had a separate calendar that was that was a solar calendar. So they they instituted the the modern calendar, which is in a, the the advantage of a lunar calendar is that anybody could do it. You don't you don't need math you know fancy yeah. mathematicians to figure out what month it's it is. Calendar. Tell you when the new moon is, and you can tell when the month when the, the full moon is, and you can start figuring yeah. out the holiday. So it was it was a calendar for the people. Yeah, but Robin, it, it works in it works in Israel. It's site specific again. Now the last one, and this is the most important one. Okay. Spirituality, so religion. What's spirituality and religion? And I know that there's always going to be that guy that's going to say, well, there's some Christian Palestinians. Okay, fine. We can deal with that in a second. What is the majority religion of the Palestinian Arabs? So the majority are Islam. What is I, there? I mean, I, 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 I'll let you finish. Islam. Where does Islam come from? No, but this is important. Where does Islam come well, from? I mean, in my opinion, Islam is a mix of, of maybe 70% Jewish and, and 20% Christian, which comes from Arabia, which at the time, shortly before Muhammad, was 300 years a Jewish kingdom. And these, and, and with a large Jewish population, who they, there was the king saw the Himyars, he had actually attacked Yathrib, which was later called Medina, and he was so impressed with the Jewish the Jewish fighters that he decided to, to convert to Judaism. He, he made his kingdom Jewish, and this is where a lot of, you know, modern Yemenite Jews, Jews come from, from the mix between the Jews that had lived there in 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 Arabia and the um, and the native Arabians who converted to, to Judaism, they were in a, a several hundred year war with the king uh, kingdom of Aksum in in Ethiopia, and they for a while they had conquered much of Arabia and Ethiopia, and this is most likely where the Ethiopian Jews came from. And then they they got conquered by the Christians, and at some points they were they were licking their wounds and saying, you know, we what are the Christians doing that are, that they're that they're beating us. So they started adopting some aspects of, of, of Christian culture, and they, they come up with this hybrid. I mean, obviously, they believe they have a prophet, and he comes from God, and he's told them all this stuff. But there's there's clearly a lot of Jewish origins. I mean, if you, I've read the Quran, it's a it's got a whole lot of a whole lot of you know Jewish stories that I that clearly recognize from the Bible. I'm not, not going to try and deny you know, that there's a lot of similarities with Rafi, but I would not. What? Anyway, uh, without getting off topic, fine. Where, where's Islam from again? Where, where, where is the, where is the site-specific area in Islam? Before, before it conquered the rest of the Middle East and the North African areas, where, where is Islam from? So Islam it was found. Where did Islam have its genesis? Somewhere in Arabia. Debated where they, they claim it's, it's what's now exactly. Called. Yeah. Exactly. Sure. Now, what, did, did like I'm not going to get into you know attacking. Where it's not, bottom line, it's from Arabia, so right. it is a foreign religion. It's just as foreign I, I don't think to, so. to Jews as Christianity. Just because, yeah. just because they they took some of the things like they have they have their uh, their dietary laws that are very similar. That if if you don't know Judaism and you just look at the two of them, you think, oh, okay, they have a specific way of killing animals. They're only allowed to eat certain things. They can't have. But there are certain things they can't have, certain things they can't. Okay, they're yeah. similar. They're not the same. Now, sure. it's different. Like, a, like I know that a, a practicing Muslim can have kosher food, but somebody who practices kosher can't eat, you know, uh, whatever they call it, halal. Sure. So, yes, I, I get those things. What I'm saying is it's a different religion. Now, because you, again, at the start we said indigenous status comes from a, an interaction of those five things. So... If you're telling me that the Arabs are indigenous, then you have to be able to show how those five things interact to make them indigenous. Those five things don't act to make them indigenous to the Levantine area. They act to make them indigenous to Saudi Arabia. Oh, I, now, whether or not they carry blood or not, is no, I, I they, think they, they, they speak a different language. They look the creator a different way. It can't be more clear. Uh, can, can I? You, you can say, look, you can say that I think way to peace is to try and find commonality. I, I would be totally okay with that. A pathway to peace would be to say, okay, these are the ways that were similar. I'm totally okay with that. But you don't get to say that these five things that make them indigenous and somewhere else make them indigenous here, and that's how we're going to find peace. That's not how this works. Well, now, I'm, I'm not even saying that they don't have rights of longstanding presence. They absolutely have rights of longstanding presence. But they are not indigenous. 
It's it's not so, difficult. I don't understand why. You, like, can I, <laughs> I, I, so I, I want to kind of go through these these five things. I want to go through these five things, and I, I'm gonna we're we're gonna wrap it up soon. But I, I, I'll give you both the the final word. I just want to propose a slightly different approach. And Ryan, I, I hope you don't. You know, I'm I always try to stay fair, but it's clear that I you know I I in this specific argument I do agree more with Rafi. I hope you do feel like we're not teaming up on you and that we're just trying to, you know, get, get to the bottom of, of these issues. Cause it's complex and, and there, there's, there's a lot here and you, you, you know, you do have an interesting perspective and a lot of information. So I hope you understand where it's coming from. Now, if we run through these five things, you know, really and number. I feel like there's a lot of. Cutting out. Support our preconceived notions. So Adar, if, if someone wanted to do something hang on, similar, Adar, 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 hang on. Yeah. You broke up. We didn't hear for about three for about a minute there. We didn't hear what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. You broke up. A full minute. Okay. Yeah, well, seconds. yeah, about a okay, full fine. minute. We didn't hear what you were saying. So um, I just I just want to, you know, sh share share a slightly different D different approach here because you know it seems like the five criteria and how they're defined there, there's a lot of subjectivity subjectivity that's up for interpretation and often how we interpret things are you know dependent on our preconceived notions and and the outcome we're, we're looking for so I, I could very very well see somebody who's trying to deny that Jews are not indigenous to land saying language okay we we speak uh, a modern version of Hebrew that doesn't really it has some resemblance, but it's vastly different from ancient Hebrew. Um, you know, it, it's not the same language that we spoke 2000 years ago. Sure, connection to land, fine, but we just came back 100 years ago. Culture, no, our, our culture today is very vastly different from what it was 2000 years ago. Blood, our blood is only half from the region, so there's not that. And spirituality, you know, that's really, I, I view spirituality, well, you can't deny that Judaism, you know, is born from this land. Fine. I'll, I'll give that one. But it, it, it's very easy to see how somebody could do something very similar and just try to deny that Jews have a language or a deep connection to the land or, well, they or do. their culture. And, and, and I just want to, one last point. And, you know, I, I think it's crucial to, to keep in mind where indigenous rights came from. And it were to protect populations living on a land from outsiders coming in and displacing that population. Now, even if, Palestinians don't meet the full criteria that that, that you defined, or it, it, they don't meet the criteria to the extent you're looking for. They still do meet the criteria of a population who was living on the land and then got displaced by a foreign population. So at the very least, what I think would be a common sense approach, you mentioned that many people just say Jews are Europeans, and I agree that it's hurtful and it's harmful. I think that the solution to that is not to say, in, no, in fact, we are indigenous and Palestinians aren't. It's to say we are both uniquely indigenous and we need to accept that. It just seems like an approach that Israelis can get on board with, Palestinians can get on board with, and that could just be a basis for moving forward. Do, do you have any, you know, inherent issues? 100%. With, with look, absolutely. I'm not saying I think where where I take issue is actually with almost everything you said because those are the arguments that the Arabs have always used against Jews, like, like and and I don't I don't agree that it's fifty percent. I know that for, for a fact that the number is much higher. It's probably about seventy percent. I do know somebody who speaks ancient Hebrew fluently. That's what his degree is in, and he, as a joke one time, only used ancient Hebrew for a couple of weeks when he was in Israel, and he actually made a video. I'll try and dig it up for you because you'll laugh because. Yeah. In point of fact, everybody understood him for the most part. They just thought it was really funny and that they, they would always say, you know, you sound like you're really old, which is humorous because, you know, 3,000 year old language. I mean, the bottom line for me is that it's all about finding points of commonality. Like my friend Yehuda Cohen, he has a very different a view of a lot of this stuff than I do, but he still he understands the difference between the Jews being indigenous and having Arabs who carry Jewish blood. And I know that there's a term even for that, for Jews that were convert, forcefully converted and trying to bring them back into Judaism. Sure. Yeah, and you see them or whatever, yeah. So, I mean, like, I, I'm, not, I'm not against that. What I'm saying is very clear. When you use a checklist, you have to use that checklist. There's no subjectivity to it. It's objectivity. 
either you fit the checklist or you don't. Now, in in regards to the peace process and all that stuff, that's a different story. That's, yeah, like for me, I don't have a problem with somebody that comes to me and says, "Look, like the bottom line is that the Jews are here. The Jews aren't going anywhere. This is Jewish ancestral land. I know that I can't treat them like an occupier. Like when you fight an occupation." There's only one way to fight an occupation. And the, the Jews actually showed the entire world how to do it in the 1940s. You make the cost of the occupation outweigh the benefits of the occupation. And that's what they did to the British. Now, the Arabs, they learned that lesson by watching you guys do that. And they think by doing the same things to you that you'll leave. But the problem is, as indigenous people, when you fight an indigenous group of people like that, you're, you're not going to react the same way as somebody who's an actual colonizer. Where are you going to go? Like that, 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 that's one of the biggest things where they don't seem to understand. When I talk about indigenous status, I'm not coming at it from the opinion that it's because the Jews own everything and the Arabs don't get squat. That's not, it's not even supposed to be in the, in the discourse. The point is you have certain rights that enable you to live on your ancestral land with self-determination and insecurity that they do not have the same rights to. They are not indigenous. They have rights of longstanding presence, which means they have the right to safety and security. They do not have the right to national self-determination on someone else's ancestral land. Now, I understand there's a push where you want to try and find points of commonality. I totally get that, but that's not my job. My job as an indigenous rights activist is to say, this is what indigeneity means. These are how you become indigenous. And if you, if you meet these criteria, then you're one of us, and I will advocate for you as a fellow Indigenous person. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Now, I, I get where you guys are coming from, because both of you guys are genuinely good-hearted people. You want to find a place where the Jews and the Arabs can live in peace and not be fighting all the time. That's kind of what everybody wants, is peace. But now you have to decide... Are you going to find peace by allowing them to take something that's not theirs? Or are you going to find peace by saying, here's you, here's me, let's sit down and talk, let's figure this shit out. Because if you if you start off by saying, well, you know, I'm going to let you be indigenous too, they're going to say, okay, well, if they're admitting that I'm indigenous when I'm clearly not, then I probably can get them to admit that this is my land and not theirs. And that's kind of been the whole peace process. That's the only reason the Abraham Accords are working so well when for decades the other stuff never worked because everybody always thought, well, we'll just listen to the Palestinians and we'll do what they say. And then because we're helping them and we're listening to them, then they're going to come part way our way. They never did. They, they've never come part way. So anyway, I, like I, I don't, I don't want to co-opt everything and talk about that kind of stuff, but somebody here was trying to say something about, uh, he wanted you to ask me about my ra my racist anti-Palestinian things uh, name one tell, tell me sometime that i've ever been racist against palestinians because palestinians aren't a race palestinian is a national identity it's not an ethnicity it's a national identity that doesn't have a nation so I, that's why i've always said palestinian when you call yourself a palestinian that's okay that's your right you call yourself whatever you want yeah I, I, but i think it's hard to have a national identity with I mean, ethnicity I mean, nationality ethnos is, is greek for for nation it doesn't it's just sort of vaguely similar terms yeah. depending on how you use them and since they don't have a country the idea that it's it's nationhood it's a nationhood that without a passport it's a bit silly you know so i mean if anything it's, I, it's I, I, and just to add to that i mean uh, racism is kind of just become an umbrella term for for you know having viewing one group as inherently superior or inferior to another and you know whether it's race ethnicity or just yeah, another racism. nation all, often that's called racism but, you know, you don't necessarily need to be your own distinct race to engage in group hate. So, you know, I, uh, just, just, but, but Rafi, yeah. all you, you know, I, I want to hear. Yeah, and, and, like, and I'm not... yeah, let's. Okay, so what I. Go I ahead, think... Rafi. Sure. So I think the way to look at the Jews and the, and the Arabs, I mean, I, there was more stuff I wanted to go into, but they're not the same way as looking at the colonizers in America, the British versus the Cree or or the Blackhawks, or the Blackfoot, or wherever, you know, whatever tribes you're talking about. Those people were clearly from Europe, very, very far away, spoke a completely unrelated language, and had no connection to the plan, to the place that you're living. So the, the, the idea that the, the conflict between the Jews and the Arabs, who are two people that have been living essentially, you know, within driving distance of each other. I mean, 
the boundaries between here and where Arab speaking people live 4,000 years ago, I could drive to in, in like four hours. So it's a, you know, they were a border, a bordering set of tribes. Both tribes spoke a Semitic language. In fact, ancient Arabic, the Quran, if I read it, and because I'm familiar with, with, with uh, Hebrew, the majority of the words I can understand because I know Hebrew. Now, modern Arabic, like modern Palestinian Arabic is, is like 30% Hebrew. But like ancient Arabic is like very, very similar to Hebrew. There are so many, you know, ancient connections between like the, the people, the, the Yehud, the, the, the people who are, became the, the Yehuda tribe, the, the Jews, they were living in a, in a part of what's now Arabia, northwest uh, Saudi Arabia. And they were, they were attested to in, in uh, Egyptian, in Egyptian writing. They're called the Shasu of Yahoo, right? They were, they, were the, they were the shepherds who lived in, in a place, Yahoo, and Yahoo is the name of, of their God. And that's where we get the name of God that we, we don't say, which comes from an Arabic word, which means, you know, Hawa, which means love in, in, in an ancient Arabic. Also, several of the Jewish customs of uh, they would they they were anti iconoclastic. They didn't believe you could have statues. So when the Israelites came here, and they, the Israelites were actually Hebrew speaking people that were you know living amongst the Arabs, but they picked up this this custom of not having you know images, and they would smash images you know of 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 statues of all the other Canaanites and their burial customs they had picked up from from living amongst the Arabs. There's all in Moses married a, a lady, a woman who's named a, a Midianite. Midianite was an Arabic speaking tribe that lived in what's now southern Israel, southern Jordan. And and a large number of these people came and joined the Israelites when they, they came to take over the land. There were people called the Nabataeans who lived in the Negev about 2,500 years ago, who were literally moved from what's now Jordan. And the Eturians were also another tribe who, who lived in, in the Galilee, and they were they converted to Judaism and, and you know adopted Jewish rites. So there's there was so much interplay between the Jews and the Arabs for, for, for thousands of years. And they, these two tribes believe they share common ancestry. We have a mythology that they, that we are descended from this guy named Abraham. And, and we both believe that story. And we believe that story 2000 years ago. So they, it's not the same way as looking at like, you're going to equate the, the struggle between the Jews and the Palestinians and all of a sudden apply that and make white Australians, you know, indigenous. That's not, it, there's, there's no way you're going to, dig in a, a thousand years ago and find white people in Australia. That's not a, that's not a real concern. And, but here, you know, you can dig up bones in, in the land I live in and find that they share a, a huge amount of ancestry with, with, you know, Arabic speaking people are speaking, you know, Palestinian Arabic with, with their ancestors. So it, it puts you in a very difficult place to try to say, I'm more indigenous than you because of, because of technicalities. Well, the people who lived exactly, you know, three hours this way, uh, uh, you know, on this side of the river, we spoke Hebrew and you guys spoke Arabic, which at the time was, was, you know, very similar related languages. And they were able, people were able to interact and, and, and speak each other's languages. And, and to say that therefore I'm more indigenous to this, this part, even though most of their ancestry is, is actually Hebrew, even though they've adopted sort of the neighboring tribes culture. Yeah. So I feel like you, right. You need to have some kind of gray area in this subject. If you want to, Get to that place of mutual respect, which is there. What there I, what is, I, yeah, okay. I I get I get the whole mutual respect, and you know what? There is a little bit of gray area, but the problem again is site specificity. Specificity. Sorry, I'm tired. Anyway, if if basically here, here's your argument in a nutshell, okay? Because I my people right now we share a large border with the Blackfoot people. If you take a look at Treaty Six and Treaty Seven in Alberta, Treaty Six is is like the in the north, and Treaty Seven is in the south. You take a look. There's a massive border, shared border. Intertribal marriage was actually a thing, you know. Sure. And then and then to be blunt, uh, intertribal stealing of women was a thing. Okay, so we do share DNA with Blackfoot and Cree. There, there's back and forth constantly. That doesn't make a Cree person indigenous to Blackfoot territory or a Blackfoot person indigenous to Cree territory. There, there, there are territories involved here. Now, I, I, you, I, I you, get you, what you're saying. And I, I, I think compared to a white person, a Blackfoot is more your fellow native to North America yeah. than someone from France. You know, no, there, there's, you could have but that. There is, that there is. Say, Listen, we're, we're, we may be cousins and, and this is the river was my side and that river was your grandfather's side, but we're, you know, our ancestors both came across, you know, the right. Okay, the but there Rafi is a, there's another, another aspect here that you're missing, Rafi. There's a there's a very serious aspect that you're missing. 
you're ignoring the fact that one of the cousins decided to colonize the other, which is the only the only reason that I compare Arabs to white people in Canada is really simple. Yeah. I, they I don't conquered and way. colonized. It's not like no, 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 but camps. they didn't conquer us. That that's not how I look at it. Oh, the Jews, the, the Jews were conquered by the Romans. We had we had started a revolt, the Herculean, uh, the Heraclean revolt. The Jews tried to fight and kick out the Byzantines. We then teamed up with our friends, the Persians, and we said, we're, we've got a big, uh, a big bad friend over here. And we, we invaded our homeland with the Persians who said we would be autonomous in their, in their empire. They ended up losing. The Byzantines came back and kicked all the Jews out and pushed a lot of those Jews into Arabia. And then we made new friends with our cousins, the Arabs. And we said, yo, these guys picked on us. Let's go, let's go beat them up. And we, we came with the Arabs when they were expanding the Jews were fighting on the sides of the Arabs. The Arabs led us back into Jerusalem. Half of the, half of the Muslims had Jewish background, anyways, and, and you know, and they brought the Jews with them. Like it wasn't exactly like they were taking over us. They didn't colonize us. They were. We sort of brought them with us to retake our homeland. And yes, the religion sort of became, you know, mixed up in terms of who's I'm sorry. right. Rafi, sorry. That's that's a complete misreading of the history. Uh, I'm sorry okay. that we're probably not going to agree. I mean, the, the sources that I that I've read are very clear. Uh, when the, when the, when Islam conquered the Middle East, the Arabs were actually ascended. The Arabs were actually in charge. Sure. Later on, there were other caliphates that kind of placed the Arabs as the primary people. But the Arabs are conquering colonizers. They did conquer and colonize the Middle East. That's yes, not but they debate. weren't conquering it from the now, Jews. The one, Jews were on their side to conquer because we at least got to go home. So we were, you know, they were they were doing us a favor by helping us conquer. We we joined them because we did, we hated the Byzantines more than we hated them at the time. So you know, from our side, we invited them back, and they so they didn't you know necessarily conquer from well, me. And yet they, later well, on. Well, Islam was forced uh, on, on the people that, that came there. And I think that was that was a travesty. But that doesn't mean that my, you know, my Palestinians who are my sort of long lost cousins who were pressured to convert to Islam are now no longer indigenous because they, you know, adopted uh, adopted some aspects of Arab culture and are, and are, you know, are living in this gray area. Yeah, but again, now, now you're using very demeaning language you're saying they adopted some they didn't they formally adopted an identity if you ask a palestinian are you jewish or are you an arab what's he going to tell you he's going to so tell you he's an arab, arab and he's yeah, right yeah so I, if somebody not, tells me look so, I, I, that's a weird thing if you tell me you identify as an apache helicopter i'm going to be like all right i guess you're an apache helicopter but I, that, that's know. how we work but they'll tell you their roots among are either among the Jews if they're open-minded, or they'll say their roots are among the Canaanites if they don't like to say that they're from the Jews. But they know that not all their ancestors were from the were from the Arabs who came from the Hejaz. Like they they know they have roots in this land. And it's hard for me to just huh. say, well, they're on the wrong side of history, yeah. therefore I'm I, I'm one up on them. It doesn't help me to get to that middle ground of saying, you know, why, how are we gonna how are we gonna come to this mutual understanding? Where I'm looking at somebody who's got roots here for thousands of years, just like I do, and how are we going to find? And I don't think that if I say that you're indigenous too, means I'm leaving. Like that's there's no way in hell. But I have to understand that they're not leaving either. Like and and, and to find that middle point of understanding. But Rafi, you have to understand that by you saying you're indigenous too, you're conceding something that you don't need to concede. That's part of the problem. Is that as long as the Arabs, look, the, the biggest thing is that. A large group of these people think that you're going to leave. Like, even read the comments. There are. I, Ryan, Ryan, that, that I, I actually, I actually think. To say, listen, if we agree that we're both from here and we start with the premise that nobody's leaving, we're going to have to find a way to get along. Either we're going to make two states, we're going to draw a line somewhere and say, this side's your side, that side's my side, for the benefit of, of, of you know, we'll both get some kind of self determination and independence. In exchange, I'll lose at least some access to what I consider my sacred sites. Or I could say, let's make some kind of, you know, federal federal country, and I'll lose some aspect of my self-determination. I'll, I'll have to share my homeland like Canada is a, is a federation. But I'll get access to all my sacred sites, and if my my rights are respected, I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy with that option also. And, and then have that conversation. Okay, so what are we going to do 
in real life because not, neither of us are actually leaving. And I figure if you start from the point of respect of saying we're both from here, if, if you want to use the term indigenous or you like holding on to that because it, it, it you know that's how you identify and you don't like want to give that to the Palestinians. Either way, we're not, we're not going to leave and we both have roots here. And so starting with that recognition, calling it indigenous, those are the, those are the language of, of, you know, modern discourse that are, that are used to describe that. Fair enough. I, like, look, look I'm, I'm not, I'm obviously not going to convince you. I'm, I'm okay with that. But what, what, what I'm okay. saying again is consistent standards. I want to make sure that people use consistent standards when they discuss indigeneity and indigenous status, because the second we use inconsistent standards, that's used to delegitimize the entire indigenous struggle, which is why when I see people say the Palestinians are indigenous, I'm very adamant that no, they are not. They don't meet the criteria. It's that simple. That doesn't mean that they don't have rights. It doesn't mean you can't find some kind of common ground somewhere else. That's not the hill to die on for me. That's not where it's going to happen. I think where it's going to happen is like what you said. If you can say, say we, we do share a common ancestry. We do share a lot of different things. Being indigenous is just not one of them. We can well, I, I see my stalkers. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I see my stalker showed up. Mm -hmm. I've got a stalker, and he's uh, he's been kicked off Twitter several times. He's been banned on Facebook, banned on YouTube, but I, I see he showed up here. Mm -hmm. How's it going, Michael? It's good to see you, little guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. I, I, look, I think we're we're gonna wrap up. You know, we we did get a lot into definitions and. You know, re really semantic arguments. What constitutes indigeneity? What what I would have liked to get into more is how how that should affect the rights people have. Should indigenous rights? Yeah. How that's different than native rights? So let's say we we can, we say Jews are indigenous, Palestinians are just native. Does that mean that we deserve rights that they don't? Again, we we won't have time to explore this now, but sure. Um, I'm I'm very. That was on my list of I, topics. I think, it, I think, I think it was an insightful conversation. It was productive. I think there's still a lot of ground to cover. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to give you each final thoughts before we wrap up, and then we'll take it to the after party in the lounge on Discord. Can one of our uh, can someone drop the Discord link in the chat, please, so everyone can join? Final thoughts, friends. Go ahead, Rafi. Uh, sure. Yeah, so the, my basic premise is that it, as, as the way to start that, that foundation of respect in the dialogue between Jews and Palestinians is to recognize that we both have deep roots here and, and to stop what, what obviously Ryan is also against, people saying Jews are just, you know, recent immigrants from, from Europe and they're conquerors to our, to our own homeland, that, that we find offensive. And, but also not to turn the tables on the Palestinians and try to say that, that therefore that's what you guys are. Try to find that, that ground and saying, listen, we both have roots here. We both believe we both do have common ancestry, and we both believe it within our mythology. We both have a we, we share a you know a languages from the same family of languages. We share related religions, and, and how can we use that to build a foundation for living together peacefully, and and not and not and not fighting, you know, with 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 respect. That's what I would say. Yeah. Again, like what I would say is that we need to maintain consistent standards when we're talking about indigeneity. I think that uh, I made it pretty clear what being indigenous is and what being indigenous isn't. Uh, how it would affect the peace process in, in a nutshell, it, it will affect it in one way. The Jews have the most legitimate claim to the land, period. Now, whether or not they want to access that claim, whether or not they want to use that in negotiations is up to them. But the world does recognize the rights of indigenous people. Now, whether or not they choose to use that or not is, is not up to me. But I will say this just to wrap up. I think that you guys both genuinely seem to be the kind of people that, that want peace. You, you're not warmongers. You're not hawkish. You're not, you're not here saying that the Arabs have no rights. I totally respect that. What I'm trying to get across to people is that the old paradigm of let's just listen to them and if we hug them long enough, they'll love us. That, that paradigm died with Oslo, right? So we, we know that that's not going to work. Now, I think the paradigm where you tell people point blank, this is how things are going to be now. And if you don't like it, too bad. That That's the paradigm we live under now. And what I think you're going to start seeing more and more, especially now with the Abrahamic Accords, with the rest of the Arab world accepting Israel's existence, you're going to start seeing the fact that, no, not everybody thinks that 
the Arabs should take over and have 99.999% of the Middle East. They already control 99.6%. You guys have 0.4%, and it's Jewish ancestral land. And I think that the now that you see Saudi Arabia accepting that, and you see Saudi Arabia coming right out and saying, you know, Israel is a legitimate state. The, the, the place where they wrote the three no's in Khartoum in the Sudan, whoever thought that Sudan would recognize the legitimacy of Israel? These, these, are, these are changing times, and we either change with the times or we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes of the past. Thank That's you both. We will, um, we will further explore this live at a later date, and we'll continue this conversation in the Discord. For those who are unfamiliar with the Discord, it's uh, whatever. I'm going to leave it a mystery. Join. The conversation can, continues there. When you enter, you'll see on the left-hand side, it says lounge. Click lounge twice and you'll be connected to the after party. If this is your first time here and you like what you see, subscribe. Like this video. G guys, check this out. We, we have zero down likes on this video for such a controversial topic. So that means you did a good job. And I did not do such a great job moderating the chat this time. There were a lot of personal attacks. I will be a little bit stricter. We are very free on the spectrum of ideas. We are willing to listen to almost all opinions, except for truly hateful ones. But there is no reason for personal attacks whatsoever. Next time, we're going to be banning people who do that. So just keep that in mind. Consider this an official warning. It was a great pleasure. Until next time, friends.